There we are. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are delighted and excited, as always, that you have chosen to join us for uh, this Sabbath School uh, discussion. We just began last week uh, talking about Paul and the Ephesians. It gave us, Pastor Ray gave us an overview of what the Ephesian people, well, where Ephesus is located, a little bit about Ephesus, where, uh, you know, a little bit about the Ephesian uh, people and uh, some of the challenges that they are facing, which amazingly are some of the same challenges that we are facing. The difference is, is that our church is well established and theirs was not. And so in terms of longevity, uh, in terms of establishment through Christ, it was very well established. So uh, if you missed that lesson, I would suggest that you go back and just kind of listen to that one uh, from last week because it re he, uh, Pastor Ray did a fantastic job in laying the foundation for us as we move forward through this quarter just because it really is helpful to kind of have an understanding of the peop the audience that's intended uh, for those original letters that he wrote. And then also to give us an idea of what it was like to live in that time. I know that I personally am always interested in that kind of information because it helps me to kind of know what the mindset is like and, and some of the, again, challenges and so forth that the people are dealing with. Yeah. I am Pat Barber from the Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. And with me and leading us in our discussion today is Pastor Ray Daniel. Good morning, Pastor Ray. How are you? Good morning. Fine, thank you. Yes, that little cold people can probably hear. It's kind of lingering there just a little yes. bit, but hopefully still uh, it's still there. Uh, friends, we are pre-recording this lesson, and hopefully by the time uh, it actually is played, which is Sabbath, uh, July 8th, our prayer is that Pastor Ray will be completely over his cold, uh, totally and completely. These summer colds are something else. So, Amen. all right. Well, before we begin, uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, bow your heads with me and join me as we ask our Heavenly Father to be with us and to bless this study that we are about to embark upon. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you. We praise you for your word. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit and the instruction and guidance that uh, is promised to us when we open your word. Dear Father, we ask you, uh, please, if you would uh, first forgive us each of our sins, and Father, that you would impart your spirit to us. We pray that it would not be our words or our thoughts, but your words and your thoughts. And may we put forth exactly what it is that you would desire that the hearers would hear today. Father, we pray a very special blessing for each person that is tuning in to us today. And we ask that, uh, or that would tune into this lesson at any time. And for all those that are uh, opening your word to study this very, very important uh, lesson as we continue this theme of unity uh, in Christ. Dear Father, we ask you uh, if you would remember each person that is listed in our prayer box. Uh, there's a number of names there with people needing uh, that are asking for prayer for various things, be it health or family situation or uh, financial situations. There's all kinds of things going on. And of course, we know there are many names that not, did not reach the prayer box. And again, we mentioned uh, Pastor Ray that he would be completely over his cold by the time this lesson uh, is uh, aired. Dear Father, we do commit this study to you and ask that you would bless it and that it would glorify you, that it would motivate us to um, desire a closer, more intimate relationship with you. We ask you please now if you would uh, help us to quiet the distractions that uh, beset us and particularly that try to encroach and impinge upon our Sabbath hours, these sacred and holy hours are yours because you made them so. And so, and we come at your invitation, Father. And so we ask that you would bless this time uh, together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Turn it over to you, Pastor Ray. All right. Well, let's see here if we can... Uh, 
see our lesson. Uh, we can. We can. I think we can see it right there. Yes. God's grand Christ-centered plan is our theme for this week. And we see in our memory text, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. We can say amen, and uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. That's about all we need to say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it really is. Isn't yes. that a wonderful assurance right there? Yes, yes. And how yes. can you top that? that we've been yes. blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Yeah. What more could he do for us than that? That's right. That's right. But our and introduction uh, tells us uh, about an incident years ago in our space program. Um, about 25 years ago, uh, Neil Armstrong, of course, uh, became the first person to walk on the moon you can imagine what a day that was for him. I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like? Oh, my. Yes. To step out on, and, and actually walk on the surface of the moon. Um, and so uh, 25 years after that, <clears throat> he wrote a thank you note to the people who had designed that space suit that he wore uh, that saved his life and preserved his life as he did that. And um, he called it the most photographed spacecraft in history and teasing that it was successful at hiding its ugly occupant from view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was very thankful for what they had done to uh, help him uh, be able to achieve that and preserve his life. Uh, and so he sent them this, what he called a quarter century's worth of thanks and congratulations. Uh, the lesson mentions that to um, lead us into the fact that Paul in this letter to the Ephesians is beginning with a majestic thank you note, uh, like Neil Armstrong wrote. Uh, it's even more beautiful than, than his, of course. And yeah. uh, uh, he's praising God for all the blessings that he has poured out. Uh, upon God's people, upon him and all of God's people, uh, essential to our lives, just like the spacesuit was essential to Neil Armstrong's life. And, and uh, Paul argues that God has been at work on these essential blessings since before the foundation of the world. Mm. So if you go back to Genesis chapter one and you read the story of creation, you have to go back beyond that. That's right. To understand that these blessings were being formulated then. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. Yeah. Uh, I had a good friend uh, when I was pastoring College View that was focusing her studies on pre creation history. I thought that was rather interesting that she was interested <laughs> in pre creation history things that had happened before creation. Well, this is one of them. This is one of them. were being prepared for us even then. And uh, so Paul here in Ephesians is uh, especially modeling for us how we can worship God and how we can praise God for these many blessings that he has provided. Now, a thank you note, uh, according to our Sunday section, usually includes a description of the gift or the gifts received. You give gifts, I'm sure, uh, from time to time. Uh, do you get thank you notes? Yes. Well, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Sometimes, no. sometimes not. Sometimes uh, not. That's they're, right. They're individuals, I'm sure, that you're pretty sure that you're going to get one from them, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know they're going to do that. That's right. And, um, what does it mean to get one? Well, you know, it's very nice. It's It, it really, it gives you, uh, you know, you get a sense of uh, 
a feel good, if you will, feeling when you give the gift. And then when you get a thank you note, you get it all over again. So it's like you get that feel good feeling twice, you know. Exactly, exactly. And uh, it's nothing you expect. You don't think they no. should do it. Uh, if right. they do it, it means a lot. Uh, but if they do it and they say, I really like this, I'm enjoying this, it means a lot to you. Uh, yeah. I had an interesting opportunity just this morning uh, to give a gift. Um, as I was finishing my second round of golf, um, I uh, met a young family that was ready to start up on the first tee box. And uh, his t-shirt said, I love my wife. Oh. I said, well, hallelujah. I'm glad to see you love your wife. And is this your wife here? And yes, it was. And he said, and it's her birthday. Oh. So, well, happy birthday to you. And then they said, it's going to be our anniversary on July 15. Oh, mm. I said, well, happy anniversary to you as well. <laughs> and uh, we were able to have a little chat about that. So uh, mm -hmm. I went on home. I got a couple of presents for them and met them on the second tea box and was able to give gifts to them. One of them, uh, was a book uh, on uh, uh, hope for the end times. Oh, uh, I gave them that little book, hope for the end times, and then each of them a sleeve of golf balls as a little gift for their anniversary and their um, and and her birthday. They seem to uh, appreciate that. I don't ever expect to get a thank you note because they don't even know who I am. But uh, sure, uh, they got my calling card, and if they ever chose to write one, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the blessing is actually in the giving in the giving yes and um uh, and when uh, god gave us these gifts he must have really enjoyed himself doing it because he poured them out upon us um, yeah. ephesians 1 uh, 3 to 14 here uh, describes those blessings again that uh, that they're every spiritual blessing uh and that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world uh, he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That's what he wanted. Uh, That's he wanted right. to be to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And then we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Uh, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That was his plan. That's that right. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, and so on and so forth. I mean... <laughs> It just goes on and on. All of the things he's done and why he did it and how much enjoyment he had in providing all of this to us. Uh, he wanted us to have all of these things and uh, be assured that we are loved, that we are provided for by him. Uh, Paul praises God for the fact that he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing mm. from this Greek word pneumatikos, pneumatikos, from the word spirit, pneuma. Um, the work of the spirit has provided these things for us. So here we have this exalted language and, and the assurance that all of this was in his plan before the creation of the world. He wanted all this for us way back then. We are his treasured sons and daughters, both by creation and redemption. That's right. Um, and you know, uh, and Pastor Ray, if I could interrupt for a quick of moment. Of course. Uh, when, I, when, when you're reading these verses, when we're reading these verses, it makes me think of back in Deuteronomy, where, let's see here, Deuteronomy 28, 2, where it says, and all these blessings will come 
upon you and overwhelm you when you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So the Lord is not chintzy or miserly about the blessings. You know, there's other language that we hear that, you know, when we give, I will open the, the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing such as you could not receive or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of language that helps that try where well, the Lord is trying to help us to understand that he has so much that he could, he still wants to give us, you know, yes. he's already given us a lot, but he is, is still wanting, he hasn't exhausted that cup that he wants to pour out these blessings upon us. And uh, I know that you've, you've shared several stories with us from uh, illustrations with us from time to time about where, how we come up short because we don't accept the blessings that the Lord has, uh, that the Lord is offering to us. And so when you were reading here about all these spiritual blessings and, you know, and all of this, this is such grand language. I just thought back to Deuteronomy and thought back to some other places in the Bible where, again, we have that same language that talks about being, and to me, that word overwhelm just really says it all, that it's just, you're just overwhelmed with the blessings that the Lord Amen. had. Amen. Very good. Very good point. Um, so in short, it's it's God's intention and always has been for us to be saved. Yes. And, and we lose our salvation only by our own choice. That's right. Uh, he wants us to be saved. If we're willing for him to save us, he will. Mm -hmm. um, I had opportunity last evening to listen to a message at the Northern New England camp meeting uh, by John Bradshaw. He's speaking there at oh, the yes. camp meeting. And uh, he told an incredible story of a uh, homeless man who uh, died uh, under a bridge overpass. Um, they found him there. Uh, uh, he had passed away during the night. And uh, what he was not aware of is that he was a multi-millionaire. Oh. He had been scavenging for food for years, just barely getting by, wearing rags, when he could have afforded to buy the men's clothing store in town. Mm. Uh, he could have bought the, the market in town and still mm. had money left over because wow. he had about $20 million. If oh my. he had known that his aunt had left him that inheritance, but mm. he couldn't find him. Uh, and so he lost the benefits of that inheritance because he didn't know who he was. God wants us to know who we are. Mm -hmm. He wants us to know what we possess, what he's given us so that we can enjoy the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this thing that we have, uh, these blessings in heavenly places, uh, we need to take a look at that uh, as to what that really means. Um, this term in heavenly places, um, it, it's the only place it's used here in the New Testament. And uh, we wanna look at the, uh, at the uses of the phrase there in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, and 3, and 6, uh, it's mentioned in each of these places, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's raised us to sit in the heavenly places. Uh, he wants to be made known by the church and the, and, and the powers in the heavenly places and so forth. Um, and then we looked at the uh, use of in the heavens in uh, other passages. Uh, Ephesians 3 and 4 and 6, uh, that uh, the whole family in heaven and earth is named and so forth in heavenly places, in the heavens itself. Um, and we're asked, well, what does all this mean? And what is telling us is that we have access to heaven in the here and now. Yes. We talk about going to heaven. 
Mm -hmm. We have access to heaven now. We're in those heavenly places in Christ because Christ is there. And when we're with him, we are there with him in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. What a thought. What a thought. The heavenly places are the place where God dwells. Yes. And it's our privilege by his grace to be there in spirit with him. Uh, it's the location of spiritual powers. It's the location of Christ's exaltation at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and so we are privileged to be in those heavenly places, according to the writings here in Ephesians. Uh, we can be thankful for the beautiful way he's described that to us. And isn't it marvelous, Pastor Ray, that this is, uh, again, just to reemphasize what you're saying there, that, um, you know, oftentimes uh, one could be tempted to think that as a Christian, life on this earth is just toil and trouble and toil and, you know, and, and just, uh, just a tribulation, just one long um, trial. But God provides us with so many blessings as we've talked about. Yeah. And isn't it wonderful to know that the reward isn't just then. He's wanting us to partake of the joy. This is part of the joy of his salvation that he talks about. And that is, I'm not talking about being happy, uh, you know, based on what our circumstances are, but just talking about the abiding joy of salvation when we uh, accept these gifts and acknowledge that he intends that we should be partaking of this right now amen amen yes we can experience it now um on monday we looked at this contrast that the apostle paul draws in ephesians between the way things were and the way things are now and he paints a dark picture of the lives of the ephesians prior to, to knowing about Jesus. Uh, he said, you were dead. You were just like you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were a walking dead person. Mm -hmm. You were living as Satan commanded you. Uh, and he said, you know, really, we all once walked that way. Uh, we were all sons of disobedience. Um, and you certainly were. You were enslaved to sin and Satan. You, you had no ability to free yourself. And, and you needed rescue. And, and the good news is God has done it. He has rescued you through the gracious actions of Christ. And so Paul celebrates uh, two blessings of God's grace in the lives of the believers. Redemption and forgiveness. Those two blessings. Now, redemption is an idea that's used frequently in the New Testament. Um, in Colossians, we see it mentioned, it says we have redemption through his blood. Um, Titus uh, talks about being redeemed from lawless deeds and purified. Um, we see in Hebrews uh, the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant uh, that we might receive the promise of the internal inheritance. So these passages share in common uh, with Ephesians that we are rescued from sin only by the blood of Jesus' sacrifice. Amen. That's right. Only by the blood. The Greek word translated redemption is apalutrosis, which was originally <laughs> used for buying a slave's freedom or paying to free a captive. And you can imagine how it felt to be a, a slave and have someone pay the price so that you could be set free. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a wonderful feeling to have that freedom given to you. And that's what he's done for us through the blood of Jesus. He's paid the cost of our sin. Uh, there's a story uh, in uh, the old bedtime stories uh, 
about the slave Joe. And, um, and Joe is on the slave block being uh, sold. And, um, and the master says, I want to buy Joe. And he starts bidding for Joe. And uh, you may have heard the story or read the story in times past. Um, Joe started to say every time he would start to bid on him, he would say, but I won't work. I won't work. I won't work. <laughs> and he kept bidding higher and higher. And finally, the slave was his. He bought him. And as soon as he was his own, the slave said once again to the master, but I won't work. And the <laughs> master said, you don't have to work, Joe. I bought you to set you free. Oh, huh. a nice story. <laughs> How thankful we can be that he bought us to set us free. Mm -hmm. To set us free. We, we can't pay for that. No. There's no way that we can do anything to atone for our sins. He did that for us. And he has bought us to set us free. We have redemption through his blood. The idea of redemption also celebrates God's gracious generosity in paying the high price of our liberty. And he gives us our freedom, our dignity. We're no longer enslaved. And so a person who has been freed from slavery is now treated as a person, not an object. Uh, you're now a citizen of heaven. You're not a slave on earth. That's the condition he, he has made us, citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Um, now, we need to notice carefully mm. that God does not pay the price of redemption to Satan. No. He doesn't owe Satan anything. The idea that he's paying Satan off to set us free is, is a medieval idea. It's not a biblical idea. He paid nothing to Satan. Uh, he merely paid the price so that our sins could be forgiven and canceled. And that's what he did for us. In doing this work of redemption and forgiveness through Christ, God is acting as our generous father. As Ephesians 1 says, he is bestowing the riches of his grace. He's just lavished them on us. <laughs> lavished them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of um, makes you think of putting your uh, whipped cream on your um, pancakes, you know. <laughs> and you, uh, you squirt that little thing and you just, you just put a big pile on there. You lavish yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they taste so good. How yeah. good that he has done that for us. He has lavished us with his grace. So this is God's grand Christ-centered plan. And he said that he would make this known uh, in the fullness of time. And we would come to know its full extent. So he's made known to us this mystery of his will, uh, according to the pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him. So his plan is to gather all things in Christ. And how extensive is that plan? It includes all of heaven, and all of earth. Mm -hmm. That's a big plan. That's a big plan. That's a big plan. Mm -hmm. And how thankful we can be that it's been his plan all along, all even along. before he created us. That's right. That's right. We see the three labels uh, that his plan uh, has been described by uh, as the mystery of his will 
and the purpose of God and a plan for the fullness of time. So what is that plan? To unite everything everywhere in Jesus. Amen. If I wanted to be uh, nasty to you, Sister Pat, I would ask you to pronounce this Greek word. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm yeah. not going to do that. Uh, it's not that easy to pronounce. Uh, it's onik polyosastai. I never would have pronounced it that way. <laughs> I, I would have enunciated every single syllable. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, the word means to head up or to sum up all things in Christ. Uh, that's what the plan is. In ancient accounting, we're told, uh, you would add up a column of figures and place the total at the top. Now, that's not how we do it, is it? We, we add up a no. column. And put right. the total at the bottom. Yes. Uh, but they would put the total at the top. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's saying that he he has summed up all this, added it all up, and uh, and that that is his total plan. It's mm -hmm. a Christ-centered plan since before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Unity in Christ is the grand divine goal for the universe. That's right. So doesn't that make sense then, Pastor Ray, that when, he, when we study and we talk about him wanting uh, God, his plan is to restore us to himself. And Christ has said, I and my father are one. And, uh, uh, you know, and he wants us to abide in him like he abides in his father. So that oneness that's there uh, I was really struck by this particular lesson because I thought, well, I thought we just studied the revelation of Jesus Christ, but here is another facet on the revelation of Jesus Christ and what a very fascinating one it is. And that is that, that this idea of, uh, I mean, we see these different pictures of, of Jesus and this particular one is this picture of unity, this picture of oneness and how much he desires that of us, because if, and he wants us to be, be uh, in unity, we have many scriptures to say that as far as, if at all possible, as far as it is up to you to live in peace with all men, or, or, or the one that says how good and pleasant it is to, uh, when brothers live together and so forth and so on. There's just many, many scriptures that talk about living together peacefully. And uh, so Christ wants for us what he has with the Father. That's right. That's right. Um, and the Apostle Paul, of course, uh, as we see here, is is weaving through this letter uh, to the Ephesians, this wonderful plan of unifying all things through the death and resurrection and ascension and exaltation of Jesus. And especially the mission that he was given was to unify the disparate elements of mankind. Jews and Gentiles. That was the special mission that the Apostle Paul was given. He was the Apostle to the Gentiles. And that was a very revolutionary thing to think that the Gentiles could now be considered saved individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. That was his mission to show that they were also included in this plan of salvation. What a wonderful thing to know because we are all Gentiles that are taking part in this <laughs> lesson study right now. That's uh, right. In person and online. So um, we see this wonderful plan outlined all through this book of Ephesians. Uh, he's saying to uh, them in Ephesians 1.15 and following, uh, they said, since I, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I, I don't cease to give thanks for you. I make mm. mention of you in my prayers. Um, in my golf outings, which I had last week, um, one of them, I always start with prayer uh, and, and usually uh, oftentimes a scripture as well. And uh, this is the one I used last Sunday morning. 
I said to the uh, golfers there, most of them non-Adventists, standing beside me in uh, 20 some odd individuals, um, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And I shared that with them and said, I, I found this this morning and I wanna share it with you because I want you to know that's the case. Mm. I always make mention of you in my prayers and I want you to do the same for me. Uh, and, and so that's the uh, format that I follow. Uh, I don't try to overdo the spirituality of the get together because sure. it's it's a it's an athletic thing as well. Right, right, but, right. Uh, but they they cannot walk away from that uh, without knowing that God is involved. And That's right. That, that this is a spiritual event as well. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, uh, you I'm, never know, Pastor Ray. It might be the only spiritual anything that they get. You never know. You, you don't and know. so, uh, so I think that it is uh, a blessing that you're able to share that yeah. uh, and, with um, them in an in, inoffensive way. They can't be offended by it. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and we need to do that for for one another to to not cease to give thanks for each each of our brothers and sisters in the church as well. Mm hmm. And so he's so thankful for them and the way they're following the Lord and how they've accepted what they've been given, uh, that they've received the spirit of wisdom and revelation and their eyes have been enlightened and they now have a hope of his calling and, and the riches of his inheritance. He just <laughs> it goes over and over the things that they've received because they've accepted Christ and, uh, and, and of the wonderful power of Christ that he is seated at the right hand of God. He, he's far above all principality and power and might and dominion and all of that that we studied last time. Uh, everything's under his feet and he's the ruler of all. And uh, he goes on to say, he's made you alive. You, you were dead, now you're alive. Uh, yeah. And you've been raised up together with him. Uh, he says, we're his workmanship. We're, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he says, now, uh, remember, you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, uh, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no hope. You were without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing, yes. Yeah, and he says, now you're being uh, built along with others into this holy temple in the Lord. So uh, he's thankful for them and for the way they're developing and growing in their walk with the Lord. So, he says the, uh, the church signals to the evil powers that God's plan is underway and their divisive rule is going to end. But it hasn't happened yet. The That's devil's right. still at work. He's come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Short time. And so because of that intensive assault on the part of the devil in these last days of times, uh, he encourages us to really unify and, uh, and walk worthy of the calling that we've been called. Uh, we need to stay close to the Lord and be one body and one spirit with him have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. We yes. need to have that oneness. He used that, that oneness. one over and over again. That's right. That's right. And I think that that is a very difficult thing these days. You know, we started our lesson uh, last week in talking about uh, so much divisiveness in the world. It isn't yes. 
uh, it isn't unique to a particular country. We, <clears throat> all you have to do is watch the evening news once and you can see that there's divisiveness all over the world. And so we know that the enemy of our souls is, is doing uh, what he can to try to divide. And it isn't just, as was pointed out in last week's lesson, it isn't just outside of the church in the world, it's inside of the church also. And yeah. I think it's something that we have to really, really spend a lot of time in prayer on asking the Lord to help us individually uh, with that, because it's so easy to get divided over, well, you name it, and, and you can have a divided opinion about it. But to not let that get in the way of what our, our primary goal and focus and reason for being on this earth. The reason that you and I are able to take a breath every moment is not related to social issues. It's not related to all of these things out there. Not to say we don't have interest in those things and, and all of that, but just remembering. Uh, and that's why it's so important to be reading God's word and doing studies such as we are doing today. That's right. Uh... So he says he wants us to all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so that is his goal for us, that we will grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Uh, so he wants us to recognize that uh, he's the only one who can make that possible. Uh, he's the one who can take this whole body of the church and, and join and knit it together uh, in a way that it will operate effectively and, uh, and usefully. And, and we need to know that we are an important part of that, an important part of that body. Every part does its share. And so we wanna do our share uh, to cause the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Yes. So he said, uh, that's your goal, what you need to be doing. Uh, you need to walk in that manner. Uh, you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and, and holiness. Uh, and then he says in uh, the latter part of chapter four, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Bonnie and I listened to a sermon by uh, one of the pastors of the Loma Linda Church recently. Mm -hmm. And um, his message was entitled, Be Kind. Yeah. Be kind. <laughs> we heard that one, Brad and Have I did Have you heard too. that one? Yes. That, that was good, wasn't it? It was, yes. That was good. And and he kept asking, you know, is this kind to, to say this or to do that? Is it kind? Uh, and, and to ask yourself the question, is it kind when you make a comment or, or say something to someone or say something about someone? Is it kind? It's a good, mm -hmm. it's a good um, thing to measure with, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. And in chapter five, he says, I want you to be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and uh, put away all sin and corruption uh, from your lives. And, and don't be misled by anyone uh, uh, who tries to get you back into a sinful way of life. But, but you, were, you were once darkness, but, but you're not now you're, you're light in the Lord. So, so you want to walk as children of light. Don't have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, so don't even, don't even think about them. Don't spend time on them. Uh, awake from the dead and awake from sleep. And, and Christ will give you light. And, and you will walk as you should walk in his will. Um, so it's got a lot of wonderful instruction for his people there as to how he wants us to live our lives in this unified uh, connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. It talks about 
uh, husbands and wives and masters and servants and children and parents and all, uh, all of these, the same idea that we are to uh, lovingly serve one another and honor one another. And then finally in chapter six, the importance of putting on the whole armor of God again, mm. uh, the shield of faith, uh, the, the waistband of truth and all the things we need to protect us from the power of the enemy. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, we looked at living in praise of his glory. And there we saw in Ephesians 1, he talked about this inheritance. Uh, he said we, we've obtained it. Uh, we were predestined to receive it uh, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. <coughs> Excuse me, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. He seems to uh, sense that that the believers there in Ephesus have have lost a clear sense of of who they are as Christians that they've that they've lost heart and he says I don't want you to do that uh, instead I want you to recognize that the the condition I'm in as a prisoner uh, is not a negative thing it's a positive thing I'm doing this for you I'm in prison for the Lord I'm not imprisoned by the Romans uh, I'm doing this for you. And uh, I'm willing to suffer anything for you. So don't lose heart at what I'm going through. And continue to remember all these blessings that God has given you. Uh, uh, you he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing as we studied at the very beginning of this lesson. Uh, so believers are not victims of haphazard, arbitrary decisions by various deities or astral powers. They're the children of God <laughs> and have access to all these blessings from God. And it's inheritance that we've received from him, an eternal inheritance, eternal life. And so he says, you need to have an unshakable confidence in your standing before God and in the effectiveness of these blessings that he provides and be constantly aware of them and thankful for them. He compares the use of the idea of inheritance in Ephesians 1, 11, 14, and 18. Uh, he says, um, we have obtained an inheritance. Uh, we, we were predestined to it. Uh, and it's his will that we have this. He's the guarantee of our inheritance mm -hmm. until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> so why do you think this idea is so important to Paul? Well, because he wants them to know that it is, as you say, it's an ironclad. You can, um, it's one hundred. Uh, today, we would have, uh, we like it when we see a warranty or a guarantee that is a 100% money back guarantee. Yeah. So th this is a 100% money back guarantee. But look at what we're talking about being guaranteed and who, look at who we're talking about that's issuing the guarantee. That's right. That's right. Um, so we can have absolute assurance of it. And he wanted them to know that. That's right. Uh, to know that they had this inheritance and that it's guaranteed by him. Um, now, it's also interesting to know that in the Old Testament, God's people are sometimes thought of as being his heritage or inheritance. Mm -hmm. Here we see in Deuteronomy 9, uh, they are your people and your inheritance. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 32, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Yeah. That's right. So this sense of being or becoming God's inheritance is also clear in Ephesians 1.18. And likely uh, in Ephesians 1.11 as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In him, we have become an inheritance. <laughs> we are his inheritance. 
What do you think of that? No. That, that's amazing. You know what? To be an inheritance, it means you must be something of value. You know, uh, usually an inheritance, generally you think of an inheritance as being something of value that's being left for someone. So again, he's wanting the Ephesians and us likewise to understand that we are of uh, great worth to our Lord and Savior. Yeah. Uh, now, if you put those in the scales, our value to him and his value to us, oh. <laughs> it would yeah. seem to be highly weighted toward his value to us. Yeah, it's out of balance for sure. Yeah. But when we think that he gave his son to die. That's for right. Us, yeah. That means that we're that valuable to him. Yes. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Uh, there's a young man that I was spending time with who had walked away from his walk with the Lord. And I shared with him this thought. I just wrote it down on a piece of paper. I'll call his name Joe. Joe equals Jesus is what mm. I mean. Joe equals mm -hmm. Jesus. I said, you know what that means? That means you are as valuable to God as his son. Mm. And how do we know that? Because we're as valuable as what someone is willing to pay for us. That's right. And that's what God paid for us. Mm -hmm. That's what he paid for you. You are, you have the same value as Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now, can you fully absorb that? That is, I'm telling you, when you, when you first said that, it sounded blasphemous. <laughs> you know, until you really start thinking about what you're saying. And that's really it's quite, powerful. quite a powerful thought. It's powerful. It, yeah. And, uh, and, and to think that we are that important to him, that he considers us as his inheritance. Mm -hmm. That's what he died for, so that he could have us, so that we could be saved. Uh, and then we have all the things he's given us that, that we have as our inheritance, especially eternal life through his sacrifice for us. That's right. And then, That's right. Yeah, before, you, before you move on, uh, there was a, a Desire of Ages quote in the supplemental reading for this lesson that says, yes. never, never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the redeemer before the throne of God. Then as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all this for us that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, quote, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And especially for the Apostle Paul and for us as well, this idea that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs with the Jews of the same body, yeah. takers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. The dividing wall has been torn down and they are now equals with us and have the same opportunities as the Jewish people to be saved by God. Amen. Hmm. On Thursday, um, the Apostle Paul moved on uh, to talk about the conversion of the Ephesians, and um, he describes the steps in their story. He said, uh, you also trusted in him after you heard the word of truth, uh, the gospel of your salvation, and, and in whom also you believed and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And so he says, these were the steps you went through. You heard, you trusted, you believed, and you were sealed. Mm. 
and in exploring the importance of of the Holy Spirit in their lives, he he's using two different metaphors or images for the Spirit. Uh, the first one is the seal that we just read about, uh, identifying a sealing presence of the Spirit that occurs from the time of conversion. And of course, in ancient times, uh, seals were used. They're still used today for various reasons, but probably not as widely, uh, to authenticate copies of laws and agreements and, and uh, validate the quality of a container's contents and so forth. Uh, these were things that were done with letters and contracts and wills and so forth in days gone by. Uh, but uh, we still have some of that going on now, don't we? We uh, do. That's we right. still seal things, so we know what mm -hmm. a seal is, is like. Um, and we see uh, examples of that in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, the use of seals uh, here in uh, First Kings as well. Uh, we have a woman writing letters in Ahab's name and sealing them with his seal, and she was serving as a as a secretary to him, sending those letters out to the leaders. Um, so a seal, uh, when it was imprinted, uh, announced both ownership and protection, and uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit does that in the life of a believer. It it shows whose we are. Uh, and, and that we are protected by that special power of God that he's given us. Uh, so he says, don't, don't grieve the spirit of God, uh, because that's your seal. You need to hold on to that and not, uh, and not grieve it, not turn it away. Uh, you've been sealed with the promised spirit. So in Ephesians 1, uh, he, he shows that... Um, at the moment you give your life to Jesus and believe in him, the Holy Spirit seals you. Uh, fra, fragizo uh, is, the, is the Greek word for that. Fragizo. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful assurance that we are, are especially marked by God, by his seal of the Holy Spirit when we first believe. Mm. Uh, as I uh, see the author of this particular statement, Irji Muscala, uh, it takes me back a long way to uh, a time that he was sleeping in our home mm. in Massachusetts mm. uh, as the uh, dean of the seminary. And uh, he was staying in Derek's bed one night as he spent a weekend with us in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, a wonderful man. Uh, Dustin happened to be uh, dating his niece at the time. And uh, thankfully, that did not work out. Uh, it was a, a nicer relationship for a while, but it's, it's best that it ended. And Christine came along. But uh, <laughs> still, it gave us a certain connection with Irji Mascala. Yeah. That, uh, mm -hmm. that we, uh, we still uh, value. Sure. Uh, the second thing, uh, the second image Paul uses for the Holy Spirit is that of guarantee, uh, that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. And, and it looks toward the moment when the inheritance to be given to us in full. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. like a down payment. Uh, the, the word translated Araban, uh, Arabon from Hebrew uh, uh, is used widely in, in common or Koine Greek to indicate a, a, a down payment, installment, uh, that requires the payer to make additional payments. So it's only the down payment, and, uh, and the full payment will be made when Jesus comes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, uh, we don't pay the down payment. We get the down payment as a gift from God uh, through his gift of the spirit. And so our job is to receive it gratefully and submissively. Well, um, there's a lot of material in these lessons as we've already discovered. There is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> there really is. A lot of material. And uh, as we concluded on Friday, 
uh, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Uh, the question is being asked, does Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 teach that God predetermines the future of human beings, predestining some to everlasting life and others to everlasting death? Is that the message you got from it as you studied it, Sister Pat? Nay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. What is his purpose? Well, first For of all, everyone... we, have to, we have to say God is not arbitrary. No. And so, first of all, just knowing that and that he's willing that none should perish. And knowing that, how, how could the answer to that possibly without anything else, just knowing those two things about God, how, how could that possibly be true? Just even knowing those two things. But no. go good. ahead. It couldn't. Uh, so what is his goal? His goal is to save us. And he died. Right. He sent his son to die on the cross that all could be saved. Uh, he wasn't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life. That was his mission, his goal to save every single sinner, every single human uh, is what he wanted to do is to save everyone. And That's that right. his eternal purpose from the very beginning, even before the creation of the world. He determined that that was what he wanted to achieve. And um, the only reason he is not going to achieve it is because of those who refuse the gift. That's right. And if you refuse the gift, there's no more than he can do. He, he's not going to force you to accept that gift. Uh, he's going to allow you to choose that gift. And if we choose it, uh, we can have it. But if we don't choose it, we won't get it. Uh, it's not an automatic thing. He did it for us so that we can be saved if we so choose. Mm -hmm. And that's what his goal is for us. Um, we see that his role in... Uh, Choosing us, of course, and determining that he wants us uh, is his divine choice. Uh, he wants to adopt us through Jesus Christ. Uh, he wants us to be saved. It's the purpose of his will, but it's only if we're willing to receive it. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 also contains vivid relational language about God's work of salvation. He's a father and he's wanting to adopt us as his children, and, and uh, he wants to give us all his bountiful blessings. Uh, the ones we talked about at the beginning, the, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Um, so we must understand the language about God's choice and predetermination in the light of this rich relational language. <clears throat> God is not a distant, unfeeling judge who makes decrees from afar, but the caring father of all his children. Amen. And God honors our human choice. Those who heard and believed and accepted received the gift. Those who didn't cannot receive the gift, and it's by their own choice. It's only by grace that we're saved, but it has to be through faith. And it's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Amen. And he mm -hmm. prays that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith, that we are rooted and grounded in love. Yes. Well, there's much more there that we could... Uh, review, but I believe we have covered the essential features of this lesson. We have. And we see in this closing quote from Steps to Christ, in the matchless gift of his son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. I guarantee Amen. you uh, that breathing that atmosphere 
is much better than breathing the smoke that's uh, resting over a large portion of the northern part of our country right now. That's right. Canada, uh, because of the wildfires. That's right. Uh, it's been very, very serious to see yeah. the uh, contamination of the air. Uh, but but this is not contaminated air. This is this atmosphere of grace mm -hmm. that's as real as the air. Mm -hmm. And it circulates all around the globe. Let's continue to breathe deeply of it so that we may live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that this is our privilege that this was your plan even before you made us. And may we allow you to do it in our lives. May we breathe of this atmosphere daily so that we can grow up into the fullness of your likeness and, uh, and, and we can be the people you want us to be. We can have this love and closeness and unity with one another as you and your son have with each other and you and the spirit. Thank you for that unity, dear Lord, and, and for your prayer that you want us to be one as you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Ray, for sharing this wonderful lesson uh, with us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And friends, we invite you, as always, to either stay on this channel to uh, join in our worship, online worship service that will begin at uh, about 11 o'clock. Or uh, if you are locally here, invite you to come to our physical location, which is at 48th and A Street, the Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. We would, uh, you would be welcomed with open arms. So we... Uh, uh, we pray that you will have a wonderful, wonderful rest of this Sabbath day and a great week. And we look forward to taking up lesson three with you, uh, which is uh, coming up very, very soon. Uh, next Sabbath, I guess it would be. <laughs> All right. You take care and we'll say our goodbyes at this point. Goodbye. I know.